Welcome to The Waypoint, a short monthly dose of outdoor and adventure travel industry news and analysis from industry thought leaders who give us their real-time insights regarding trends impacting your business as the year progresses. We'll drop an outdoor Waypoint episode on the first Wednesday of each month, adventure travel on the second Wednesday of each month, product trends on the third Wednesday of each month, and we're trying to record live at a venue or campsite near you on the fourth Wednesday of each month. Hit us up if you'd like to host us or have an adventure we need to join. This episode of Waypoint from the Outdoor Biz Podcast is our monthly update on trends and analysis in the adventure travel space. Today I'm speaking with Teresa Knoian and Michael Hodgson from High Travel Tales. We talk about how the year is progressing, some of the trends they are seeing, the recent ATTA Summit event, and much, much more. The good news is the record button is working. The bad news is it wasn't pressed. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Waypoint from the Outdoor Biz Podcast, Michael and Therese. How's your evening going in Germany tonight? Uh, the evening is going well. It's been a lovely warm evening sitting by a, a canal, having a little glass of wine and enjoying ourselves out in the, out in the atmosphere. When yeah. the weather's nice, Berlin, everybody turns out outside. So here we are on a midweek night, and the place is full. And so we managed to have a beautiful little table beside the river and watch the touring boats go by. It was a nice way to end the day. It's mandatory to be outdoors. It's warm. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Same thing goes on here. You know, we're all, you know, bundled up in Bishop all winter long, and it's a spring day. It turns 70 degrees, and everybody's out. It's great. Got to do it. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So now we were just talking, you guys have been, you, you shifted your focus more towards adventure travel and away from outdoor a little bit, but you've been traveling forever, like all of us, right? Yeah. Traveling has been a part of our lives, both of our lives, for a very long time since we were children, um, frankly. And as we got older, it became very adventurous and very exploratory. Um, but of course, we were winter sports industries for snooze so that meant that the focus of much of our stories and our coverage and our news was on products and companies and not the travel that we were experiencing as we were going to um events and and other coverage locations right so this is not necessarily a huge switch in overall stories and coverage as much as it is in perhaps the focus of what we're doing when we're there. Gotcha. Yeah, I I don't, I don't see it as much of a leap at all, Rick. It's, it's, it's funny. I think again, we, we find people tend to pigeonhole. I know there's, there's there's folks that we speak with that that are kind of thinking of us as new to the travel industry. and, And while we may be new to the adventure travel trade association and new to just focusing about, writing about travel has been part of our lives for well as long as i can as long as i can remember so I, you know we used to we used to go backpacking or climbing or kayaking or any a number of adventures that i used to do and travel to get to there and right. the, the, the switch with adventure travel is you're traveling and then you go kayaking and backpacking and climbing <laughs> so it's uh it's 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 all the methodology and how you look at it so, yeah no. think about some of the events that we'd go to or, or, or uh, trips that we'd be invited on. And part of those trips were, uh, like Michael said, backpacking or camping or, you know, uh, doing Via Ferratas or adventure races or, or whatever they were. Yeah, like when you did Via Ferrata in Italy. Yeah, yeah. I went to a Dynafit um, summer product launch. And part of that was we not only hiked in southern Germany, but then we also did the Via Ferrata and the Dolomites in um, South Tyrol and northern Italy. But of course, I didn't. I mean, I actually did write about the Via Ferrata just because I had to. It was so fun. So that was really an adventure travel story. It just so happens we also then wrote about the product news from um, the event itself. Yeah, I think, I think the fun thing for us now is when we were traveling for snooze, we always had to write about the product, um, even though we had amazing experiences uh, on a. On a uh, a Solomon tour and, and we were in Chamonix and they took us to this amazing French restaurant in a farmhouse. And it was a great, great experience. It was something that travelers would dream of doing, but there's nothing I could write about. Oh, right, now I can. Right, right, right. And High Travel Tales, tell us a little bit about that. That's been up and running for a while too. That's not new necessarily either. 
It's it's an evolution. We used to run a website that actually won a number of awards, and then, so we kind of let it sort of slide when we were running Snoo. It's called Adventure Network. You might remember that. I do, yeah. And, yeah, and that was, again, more focused on the adventure side of outdoors and fitness um, travel. Yeah. Yep. We resurrected that to a degree, but we really kind of wanted to, to focus on kind of get the travel name more in there and focus more on the travel. And Teresa actually came up with the name My Travel Tales, and we decided to, to morph the website into that. And that was 2015 when we, when we made that switch. Let's yes. explain what that's H-I Travel Tales, not H-I-G-H. Right. And H for Hodgson and I stands for Ignoring. So it's really our names. Hi, Travel Tales. Perfect. I love it. And it's a cool oh, yeah. website. You guys have a lot of great stuff on there. Oh, we, well, thank you. I, I can't tell you how many people do laugh when they hear our name and they ask where we're from. And we say we're from Grass Valley and they're kind of like, hi, Travel Tales. <laughs> and you're from Grass Valley. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that, that's not what that means. Right, right, right. <laughs> you need to get some uh, some grass travel content on there. Oh, yeah, maybe, no, some, maybe some cannabis travel. I like exactly, that. Exactly, right? Oh, that can, uh, visits and um, shares, I bet, huh? Yeah. The you, cannabis you, tour of Colorado. Yeah, your followers we're would all... explode. <laughs> yes, they would. <laughs> so, travel always inspired us. Yeah. So as you guys are writing more about the travel aspect and the experiences nowadays, have there been any surprises from what you were experiencing before? Has, 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 have those experiences changed? Have they gotten, you know, I don't know, better, worse? I'm sure they're different all around, all around the world as we all experience that. I, I think I think the biggest surprise I can speak for myself, although Teresa and I talk about this a lot, is just um, the way the business has changed perhaps a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, certainly gets, gets us surprised. Um, the, the explosion of, of, uh, of blogging as such an important and influence, you know, influencers, uh, as being such an important part of a business, right. uh, that, that graying area of, of trained journalist and experienced blogger and inexperienced blogger, they all seem to kind of meld. There's some very new bloggers out there who are incredible, and, and it's, it's fun to see. But it's it's been kind of surprising to sort of look at just the way um, that traditional journalism isn't uh, – it doesn't have the same credibility. Right. Both of our backgrounds really are in traditional journalism. I mean, that's where I began. My degree was in journalism, and I always traveled. It so happens I ended up looking at daily newspapers and then – freelancing and then of course working with running snooze so we bring that very traditional journalism background to our travel stories and travel blogging we're very particular about research and talking to people and fact checking and making sure grammar and everything is correct and sometimes I think that some of the new world of travel blogging it doesn't quite understand some of those um particular research oriented detail oriented or, uh, or it's not important or it's not important yeah. I mean, it's, it's, and that's the other thing we've had to understand it may not be as important to the readers and, and so we we've just had to learn to adapt and we're adapting well we think um although it's still sometimes hard for us not to uh not to spend hours on a story yeah um uh <laughs> <laughs> well that's true and we can tell I was going to say that's mm -hmm. happened in the regular world of journalism too. I mean, you hear about the the big news companies fighting that every day, especially t these days. Yeah, I yeah. know. Ab absolutely. It's, it's it's been a learning curve for us, and 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 I think you know I think we're managing. That's uh, it's it's, it's uh, it, there's good days and bad days of, of frustration. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think I think we're managing well. We're we're certainly having fun doing what we're doing. We're having fun, but I think that there's some proof in the pudding in terms of managing because we can see our, our numbers, our visits, our page views, our, our likes, our shares, our follows, and all those wonderful things going up exponentially right. just in the last year and a half as we've really begun to take some pretty hard focus on, on, the, um, on the travel writing and travel blog itself. So I think there is definitely some, some 
proof there. Right. It's less than, it's probably more than I think. And we're working harder and harder at it. Yeah. yeah we're well, still trying to have fun. <laughs> yeah. You got to mix fun in there. Exactly. So have you seen any recent trends that we should be aware of related to travel, adventure travel? Well, yeah, I think it, it's what's, what's interesting to, to us. Um, and certainly, I mean, if, you, if, if you're looking at adventure travel trends, I would always point people towards uh, surveys and the numbers from the Adventure Travel Trade Association because yeah. they, they're always doing some things we experience personally. And even just today, sitting down in the, in the press office in, in, uh, in Visit Berlin, um, you, you're hearing a lot about Epicurean travel and mm. food, uh, food type travel, food focused travel. Um, we're seeing a lot more uh, in terms of, which is our type of travel, that local experience, local connection, um, not just trying to, you've always heard, think like a local, be like a local, but it's, it's actually living in a place and experiencing a place. And um, Therese had a, a tagline. Um, what we're, was very, it? we're very keen on not just go to a place, kind of checking it off our list to get to a place and, and live a little bit like a local, spend a few days there, immerse ourselves in the culture, explore the, um, the back neighborhoods that the tourists don't necessarily get to, really experience the place in some ways so we can write stories that have perhaps a more local flavor and in-depth flair and not just, well, okay, this is, the, this is the top neighborhood that everybody should go to here. So we're going to go there, take a few great photos and pop up a great story. And there you go, check it off. Right. And, and that is a big trend is the temporary local travel, as they call it. Yeah, you're starting, you're starting to see that is that that personal connection, people are trying to um, integrate the, I mean, think the tagline trees came up with, is, and we do it as immerse, explore experience. Um, that, that, it, that has also been a surprising to go back to your other question, Rick, that was, uh, surprising to us to find how many travel writers just check it off. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done that. Uh, we, we went to Venice. No, really? You know, no, seriously. <laughs> you know, you've been, been in Venice for three hours. I got the photograph. I got the story. I'm out of here. That's disappointing. And, that's not how we do it. Um, yeah. And that's, I, I don't think that's how our readers want us to do it. So, Yeah, it seems like the readers are looking for a more personal experience to read and learn about so that they can go have their own personal experience wherever they go, right? Their own personal local experience. They don't necessarily want to go to San Francisco, head out to, you know, Pier 39 and Coit Tower and, you know, the wharf and say, great, I've seen San Francisco. They just as soon get into the, the little tiny museum around the corner and the great local restaurant that the people who live there go to, too. So that's the kind of thing we're really trying to appeal to because, frankly, that's all about the immersion and the local travel. That really appeals to us personally. Right. Yeah. Right. Why not share it? I love people it. Want I love it. Yeah. People want to be surprised. People, people want to discover things. They want, you want to, even though you may be the 10,000th person to be there, you want to feel like you were maybe the first. Exactly. Can. Right. Um, yeah. Exactly. We're, we're also seeing, we're seeing um, another trend that's happening, and this is an unfortunate one, is overuse. Mm -hmm. um, you're starting to see as, as the travel industry continues to boom, um, you're starting to see uh, travel places become overused. And that's certainly a, uh, something that that uh, we work very hard to try and point people um, away from. If if the crowd is going left, we want them to go right. Um, we try to find the uncommon and the common experience. I know today I was just watching a um, uh, um, a video of of someone touring through. Um, oh, it was in Zion National Park. It was the Narrows, mm -hmm. and the video person had it's a beautiful video but uh, we've all seen the narrows and i know everyone has to go see the narrows but there were literally i kid you not a thousand people you yep. could have you could have walked as easily on the people as you could have walked <laughs> in the water in the narrow yeah and that to me is that's not an experience i want to share with our readers uh, right. because it's also damaging and there are other canyons there are other places that are as beautiful as the narrows we want to guide people there too that's great um show them other so we don't get that what you start calling over tourism I yeah is, is, mm -hmm. a, is a way to yeah but there's a struggle with that though because there's certain places 
be it the Venice, Venices of the world, where they really are pretty much one of a kind. We were just in Antarctica. And Antarctica is also struggling with this increased overpopulation and tourism. You know, it's one thing to be on a uh, expedition ship with a hundred people and you can do landings and still feel like you really are at the end of the world. But then you have the cruise ships coming through with 400 people and they can only land a hundred at a time. Right. And people like that are literally just cruising through pointing at Antarctica over the, the bow of the ship and going, yep, <laughs> I was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How yeah. many crew? I was there. Well, how many crew- I was there. I, I was there like 20 years ago. How many cruise ships did you guys see on your trip? Well, we're near the end of the season, but we were, we saw four or five um, different expedition ships when we were in there. And again, it was, um, we were, we were in there at the, at the end of February, first part of March. So it's, it's yeah. the end of, of, their season as they're heading into winter. Yeah. Um, but they're all talking about over tourism in Antarctica. Oh, yeah. Um, over visit. Yeah. yeah. And, I think that's happening uh, everywhere. It, it's just, you know, as the world population grows, where everybody goes, just the nature of the beast, I think. I mean, I'm not sure. Right. Yeah. It's a and challenge. Everyone wants, yeah, it is a huge challenge. Everyone wants to see the Galapagos. Everyone wants to see, um, you know, go, go to Vienna and, 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 and see the famous square. Take a picture of Marco Polo. Yeah, right. everyone right. wants to see that and I understand that, but there's also a price to be paid in there. And I yeah. I, for us, as, as, and I think for travel journalists, the, the challenge, and this was no different than when I was an outdoor journalist um, back many, many years ago, <clears throat> a long time ago. Right? Uh, <laughs> Come on, no, it wasn't but, that long ago now. Come on, hold on there. <laughs> yeah, right. We're both young, I forgot. Um, <laughs> it was, it was um, for many years. It wasn't necessarily that long ago. <laughs> That's true. We did, it, we did it for many years, but that was always a debate then too. If, 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 as you write about things, and a wrestle I always had, if we shared the trails, if we shared the view, if we shared the waterfall. Um, by sharing it, you encourage people to love it. By encouraging people to love it, you encourage people to respect and protect it. Right. At the same token, you always perhaps encourage people to overuse it. Yeah. And there's a balance, and that's I think that's we're always wrestling with that. That yeah. certainly has to do with the natural landscape. I mean, frankly, that has to do with tourist sites and even things like restaurants. We went to a restaurant last week here that I had been to about a year and a half ago. And when I went to show Michael where it was, it's a little tiny, very authentic little place. Somebody had written on a review, well, this used to be my secret place. Not anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. It overuse is overpopulated. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, and that's, I mean, you look at look at Iceland, for example, and this this came out of uh, a recent study again from the Adventure Travel Trade Association. But it's something everyone's become pretty aware of is um, five, six years ago, seven years ago, Iceland was having some trouble. Um, uh, they obviously having some financial issues, but trying to attract tourism, and they did this huge push to attract tourists. Well, the number of tourists in Iceland is tripled. Yeah, mm-hmm. almost, and and with tourists hitting Iceland. I think the number is uh, five or six times the local population. I think it's five times the local population. And that's, that's a huge number. Yes. Well, yeah. And at some point, unsustainable. I mean, I guess that's the, neg- the next big challenge for us is to figure out, okay, well, how do we how do we mitigate some of this? And, you know, that's why we all love it. And we're all working in it to, to figure that out. Want, you want people to visit because you want people to love something. And, and it's only protected when it's loved. Yeah, yeah. But it can well, be over. Yeah, and there's an educational component there too. I think that we could dial up and make sure that when when they do come and they do love it, we also make sure that they're aware of you know the issues with loving it, and we're getting better at that. Yeah, that's and that's another trend, and that we're seeing happening increasingly uh, is is seeing more and more responsible outfitters uh, making the sustainable part of the experience. And by sustainable, I'm just not talking environment here, but cultural sustainability, right. interact, not, not having a negative impact upon the culture, upon the villages, upon, uh, the, the uh, upon the natural place, um, really working hard to, to help people understand that everything they do has an impact in every, every life they touch. And that's important. Yeah, but yeah. traveling also responsibly, I mean, certainly with over tourism, I mean, numbers are numbers, but at the same time, it'll, we'll take Antarctica again as an example. 
you need to respect the wildlife. I and mean, we saw some people who thought they were in Disneyland, I think, who wanted to reach out and grab the penguins, yeah. you know, and were taught, stay back five meters, don't touch them, yeah. you know, don't feed them anything. And people just ignore that and they forget it's a natural environment. This is a real life city where people live and breathe and work. You, you need to think a little bit differently and responsibly and, um, you know, respectfully, in, be it a wildlife experience or be it an urban experience. Right, right. Yeah. So what are you guys most excited about of all the things that you've recently done or trends, something came out of the ATTA, a place on your list? What's What's got you jazzed? Uh, wow. <laughs> it is not one thing in particular. Yeah, what's got me jazzed? It, it, it could be all of the above. It, it could be all the opportunity. That could, yeah. be, that could be it. I think it is. I think it's it's. I mean, well, no, Teresa's, it, Teresa's jonesing to jump in here. No, it's, it's, it's such a big, broad world. Exactly. You know, and there's things, you know, we've been drawn over the years very strongly to Europe. And yet after being in Argentina and from Argentina, of course, to jump into Antarctica twice in the last few months, we are so thrilled about experiencing experiencing more of South and Latin America, which, you know, that's certainly not new, mm -hmm. but it's, it's like, wow, wow, there's a lot more there. There's a lot more, you know, there's different places we want to get to, be it the back roads of, um, you know, Romania, or, or um, we want to get to San Marino, little tiny places um, that are very important. I think it, it, it's for me, um, people, people ask me, where's your favorite place? in the world? Where do you want to go to next? And what is your least favorite place? And all these are natural questions and I understand them. But mm -hmm. I think for me, I just, I love, uh, this is what I love about traveling with Therese. Is we, we just love, I love learning. Uh, I love experiencing. I love tasting and smelling and, and, and everything that's, that's new and sensory. I think that's what I, when I fell in love with Berlin, it's just, Everything that I love about travel, I would experience, and I experience many places too. But yeah, it, yeah. you know, sitting at a cafe with my iPad sketching, or right. drinking a coffee and listening to the chatter of people in the background while the sun's shining down, and you're hearing the birds, and you're watching somebody in a balcony hang their laundry. It's it's walking in 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 the wild high uh, plateaus of the Puna, um, looking at just some amazing landscapes. It's, yeah. It's discovering history and in, 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 in the architecture. It's discovering the stories and rubble of, of a building because every brick has a, a story to tell. All that is just, it just gets me so excited. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and frankly, part of the go ahead, sorry. is also sharing excitement, right? Sharing yeah, right, the insights right. and the excitement. And mm -hmm. I don't want to forget, Rick, is that, sure, we've talked about, you know, South America and Europe and Berlin and Romania wherever but you know sometimes adventure travel is out your back door exactly um we found some amazing things just at our back door and frankly i think sometimes we end up taking that not um experiencing it enough or as much as we should yeah, yeah. i agree yeah 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 somebody it's asked real. me that somebody asked me the other day where my favorite place to take photos was and i said you know to tell you the truth it's wherever I'm taking photos, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's just, there's so many different places. You can't, we're, we're, the three of us are very fortunate. We've traveled around the world and saw a lot of great places, but there are a ton, you can't see them all in your lifetime. So that's, I love that. It, yeah. It's what's next. Yeah. That's yeah. great. What's interesting to me, and you just said that your favorite thing is take, you know, any place you visit, you're taking photos. And for Teresa and I, I mean, I love taking videos. I love photography. Teresa loves photography. I love sketching. We love writing about things, but there's times too, I think and perhaps the biggest challenge for me personally is sometimes learning to put down the camera yeah, right. and yeah. put down, put down the notebook and mm -hmm. allow life just to happen around me without thinking about the story or the image mm -hmm. or how I can capture that. And I, that, you know, I know you haven't asked about what's the greatest challenge, but that for me is one of my greatest challenges in this whole travel thing is not getting so caught up in the story I need to tell 
and sometimes just letting the story happen around me without having to worry about telling it. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, it doesn't all. I, I think the best photos I have are the ones I haven't taken, but I've memorized <laughs> the time I was there. It's like, you know what? I'm not going to push the shutter. I'm just going to step back, take it all in, and, and, you know, snap it in my memory. And those are just, I can remember those places. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We need to travel together. Yeah. That's right. We need to do something. Yeah. We'll have to get that on the calendar. Absolutely. So you were just back from the um, ATTA Summit. How was that? What was your experience like there? The Summit was great. I mean, I, I think summits with like-minded people, you find inspiration and new ideas. Um, I mean, that's, you know, when, when you and I were there in, in, uh, in Alaska and Anchorage, I think. Right. Is you, you just you come out of a, a, a summit, no matter where it is in the world, kind of energized and inspired. It's, it's rather like rendezvous at uh, right. the Outdoor Industry Association and rendezvous. It's just, you, you can go in there, you can go in exhausted, you can go in beat down, and you just come out of there just full of 360 ideas that you want to implement, places yeah. you want to visit. So yeah. um, the, the, uh, the experience in Salta for, for us, I think, was great. It was great for our business. Um, for me, it was great. I got to experience, um, I was inspired to experience some, uh, place that I might not have otherwise learned of mm-hmm. because of the summit. And that was, that was the, uh, uh, Ellen Panatrable National, uh, National Park, which we wrote about in High Travel Tales. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, uh, it's a brand new national park that was actually born out of murder, believe it or not. So oh, wow. man with the man who owned the land was murdered and that's that's in the story but it's to see the people that are now falling in love with this place was was amazing yeah cool um, yeah. yeah so, so that, was was, second, that was your second that was your second one michael that was your first one therese is that right yeah that was my first one and i honestly had no idea what to expect <laughs> um I would tell you that, yeah it's like pretty you don't have any idea what to expect yeah right but of course there's pre-summit adventure trip mm-hmm. and so you don't even get to the conference or the summit before you're actually heading off with a group of people who will also be there with you mm-hmm. and like michael went to taco i have heard over the years so much about patagonia that i chose a trip that took me to patagonia oh cool and i have to tell you I, the connections i made the tour operator was amazing we're like great friends now looking forward to seeing each other again and the stories and the experience were it was incredible it was what i exactly wanted needed oh and of course it helped that michael left for chaco a day before i did out of buenos aires so i got to go do a tango lesson with a couple of other women who yeah. were going to the conference with a very good looking argentinian man Fun. yeah 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 because i'm just as i'm disappearing into the park ready to go dark for six days no cell service the last image I get is a text of a picture of Therese in that very, you know, passionate tango pose with this very <laughs> handsome opinion. You know, literally every, the, the, the five other people on our, on our trip that they're all, we were all pressed, looked at that photo and goes, well, that's the last time you're going to see her. <laughs> that's right. Might as well not go back. Keep going. <laughs> that's yeah, funny. Back from Patagonia, there were actually a couple of other trips going down out there. So and there were a couple of dozen people on our plane from the south all the way back up to Salta. So we got to know a lot of other people. So by the time you got to the conference, you felt like a family. Yeah, right. You had some connection. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's good. And uh, it sounds like you had fun in Antarctica. Antarctica was great. It's been a it's been a bucket list for me for a long time. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a bucket list for you, was it, Therese? No. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was, I'm, a, I'm a tad bit sensitive to the cold. Yeah. Um, I have something very odd called Ray Nose, which kind of makes me very sensitive to the cold. And so when I first heard about this Antarctica thing, I was very, very leery and a tad bit concerned. But I will tell you, as we've written in, um, I, the first story we've written out of it was about of course, I had to write this about I saw staying that. warm. <laughs> Stay warm. And it really wasn't that hard. I mean, I was extremely comfortable. And once we got there and I got over my anxiety 
I was like a little kid jumping around trying to, you know, get in the next boat to get to the landings next. So it was it was really very, very exciting. Yeah, that's a cool place. Yeah, I think if I look, I, I, actually, I will challenge Teresa a little bit on this one, too, because I think you were not excited about the, uh, the, the length of time one spends on a ship. Oh. <laughs> right, right. You that's know, what that's what I was most worried about. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you sit there and think about it. You're on a 10-day adventure into Antarctica. You see this in the brochure, and then you read the kind of – you look at the fine print, and you realize four days of that is actually in a cruise ship. Right. Going right. with – and I know Teresa wasn't all that excited about it, but it, was, but it was one of those prices you have to pay for the journey. The, yeah. same, the same thing happened to us in the Puna, which is the, the high plateau just um, in northern Argentina uh, with the view of the Andes. You're, we're literally in a four-wheel drive all day long, right? And that's you—you you get out to take photos and maybe for short walks, but you're stuck in a vehicle, Eesh. and it just doesn't sound attractive. And yet, that—that that was amazing too. So it, that it, sparked my life. Now, yeah. Rick, you know me—I don't do really well sitting still. <laughs> so, as a matter of fact, she's fidgeting right now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. I gotta go. <laughs> of being in a ship or in the Puna's case being yeah. in a you know four wheel drive vehicle for that length of time I'm like oh gosh I can't yeah. go for a run I can't go for a hike I can't go for a oh no but you know if, if you're going to enjoy travel you have to do that um, I can't say it was easy at first and then you kind of go with the punches well, and in the ship it, case th- you definitely with the role. Yeah. Yeah. And think about the first time you got in a plane to fly all the way around the world to go somewhere and you think, oh my God, it's a 21 hour flight. I can't do that. But now, you know, it's, we've gotten used to it and we do it, you know, with some regularity. So we, we all get used to those things. I was worried about the same thing though when I went. It's like, oh my God, what? And it turned out to be not bad. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the price you pay for anything you do in yeah. life. Yeah. It's the same yeah. thing with backpack. I have yet to find anyone that tells, that, that, that will admit. Oh my God, I love to wear a 50 pound backpack <laughs> for eight hours, hauling yeah. it up and down a mountain. That is so awesome. Oh, yeah. yum, <laughs> free truck food. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, anything else in the adventure travel world we should keep an eye on, our eye on as we move forward in the year? I think, I think in anything travel, you want to keep your eye on the geopolitical climate mm-hmm. because that's certainly going to affect travel yeah uh i think one should never be afraid of it but one needs to be aware of it um uh i think the the way in which the travel industries continue to address and evolve um that whole idea of overuse over tourism in certain areas and how they work to help mitigate that is something certainly to keep the eye on um i mean if you sit there and look at top places to visit and where your dollar and your bang for the buck those are all undervisited places this year that are going to be suddenly overvisited next year. Right. Um, Portugal, you know, Portugal right now is undervisited. I can pretty well assure you in another year or two, that's not going to be the case because mm-hmm. everyone's going, my goodness, I think they get to Portugal. Yeah. Um, so, I, it, so just because some magazine, popular magazine writes the list of the top 10 places you should get to in 2019, that doesn't mean that those are the places that you should go in 2019 because frankly you should probably go there in 2018 or wait because everybody else is going to go there. Yeah. Wait 10 years. Those are the places you shouldn't go right now. You should wait 10 years. Yeah. Right. Or you can go to other parts. If they mention a country, you should certainly go to other parts in that country. Yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. It's a big, it's a big world and a big globe with a lot of space. So there's plenty of room for all of us. We just need to explore uh, we need to learn to separate a little bit. That's a lot right. of people certainly worry about the expense. There are new airlines on the market um, that you can really take advantage of some great deals. Uh, Norwegian, Norwegian Air, Iceland Air. Um, there's different places you, know, you can look for specials. I mean, it doesn't have to be this mind-blowing, I'm going to spend a year preparing for it and saving for it. Um, it you know, again, live and travel like a local. So mm-hmm. the restaurants around the corner, if you take out, you can do it. Yeah. Everybody can do it. Yeah, you're right. It's it's become very affordable. I mean, that's that's one of the things that's driving some of the impact is it is so affordable. But you know, don't don't yeah. sit at home on the couch. Go, you know. That's mm-hmm. great yeah, go. Advice. Yeah. Yeah. 
if I hear one of my person say, oh, someday I'm going to, it's like, oh, some days are for people who are sitting in the casket yep. ready to die. Yeah, exactly. Get out there and do it. Go, go, yeah. I know. Well, thanks, guys. It's been great catching up with you. Hope I will uh, didn't keep you out too late. <laughs> no, no, this is this is about an hour past my uh, my bedtime, but I, I'm, I'm I'm drinking caffeine, so we're good. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, <laughs> Rick. Yeah, well, we'll have to catch up when you guys get back. Um, I might be down south at that point, but you know, let's do something somewhere. Well, it's an excuse for us to travel down south you so we can play yeah, i like that yeah perfect idea perfect example yeah come on down we'll uh do some kind of a travel adventure travel thing around costa mesa oh there we go that, that's see and it sounds exotic we it's, could write about it in costa mesa yeah you know, and i'm sure there are some exotic things we can find i'm sure there are <laughs> <laughs> all right all right thanks guys thanks, have Brady. a good time Take care, bye bye If you want more of The Waypoint, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher or go to theoutdoorbizpodcast.com where you find all the episodes, show notes, and much, much more. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at The Outdoor Biz Podcast, Twitter at Rick underscore Says, that's S-A-E-Z, and by email at rick at theoutdoorbizpodcast.com. Thanks for listening and all the support. A huge shout out to all my guests, and until next time, make time to get outside.